Well, good evening and welcome both to the University of Manchester and to the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, HCRI for short. I'm Jeremy Gregory, and I'm head of the School of Arts, Languages and Cultures, which came into being on the 1st of September. And I'm delighted that tonight's inaugural annual public lecture for the Institute also forms part of the eight-week program of events celebrating the creation of the new school. So if you like this, there's lots more to follow. Uh, and the new school is home to some 17 dis different discipline areas. In its very short three-year life, the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute has proved to be a unique space, I think, bringing together scholars working from a huge range of disciplines in the arts, social sciences, and medicine to engage with humanitarian concerns both throughout the world and more locally within Manchester. The Institute has acquired a formidable track record of grant capture and raising funds, and alongside its ambitious research projects, it offers PhD and MA programs, as well as now having a presence at undergraduate level. One of the key concerns, both for the School of Arts, Languages and Cultures, and for the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, is to confront, critique, and involve ourselves with issues of contemporary and historical concern, both in our teaching and our research, but also in the ways in which we engage with the wider world beyond and outside the academy. And this annual public lecture is designed to provide a public forum for engagement and debate about humanitarian issues. And it's my very great privilege to welcome Claire Short to the university, who will be addressing us this evening. I can think of no better choice of speaker for this inaugural lecture. Claire Short was MP for Birmingham Ladywood from 1983 to 2010. From 1996 to the general election of 1997, she was opposition spokesperson for overseas development. And between 1997 to 2003, she was Secretary of State for International Development. Notable for her opposition to the war on Iraq, she has not been afraid to stand up for her beliefs and offer trenchant criticism of official policy when she felt it was needed. Resigning from government in 2003 and resigning the Labour Whip in 2006. Since standing down from Parliament in 2010, she has been busy, tremendously busy, in a number of organisations, working, for example, on slum upgrading in the developing world, transparency in oil, gas and mining, African-led humanitarian action, trade justice for the developing world, helping destitute asylum seekers in Birmingham and pressing for a just settlement in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The list is formidable, and tribute not only to her energy, but her commitment to a wide range of humanitarian concerns and issues. On a day when this morning, the Radio 4's Today programme included several items covering the Prime Minister's commitment to overseas aid and the debate surrounding that commitment, the theme of tonight's lecture not only addresses one of the big challenges facing the world today, but is also very timely. I therefore invite Claire Short to deliver the inaugural Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute annual public lecture on Has the Humanitarian Moment Passed? A Humanitarian Surge and Its Demise, 1997 to 2003, a public account. Claire Short. Thank you very much. It's good to be here with you all and to nurture special places like this where the, the values of a better world live on. And by coming together, we can strengthen them and hopefully take them for, for, forward. What I want to try and achieve in the course of this lecture this evening is to describe the very important window of opportunity that arose between the end of the Cold War in 1989-90 and the declaration of the war on terror uh, in 2001 too. 
and to try to draw out some lessons from this experience. And I want to do this not simply to share with you my account of those years, but because I think reflection on the experience of those years can teach us important lessons about what needs to be done to advance humanitarian values. I want to suggest that humanitarianism is too often perceived as a marginal series of worthwhile activities. Famine relief, development assistance, peacekeeping, emergency humanitarian relief, relief which are all important, of course, but which, which exist alongside the main thrust of foreign and defence policy and too often fail to challenge the central thrust, thrust of those policies and, and therefore the conditions that perpetuate the humanitarian emergency continue and the humanitarians do worthwhile things but help to prop up a, a malfunctioning system. Um, I can't speak with any inside knowledge of the period between 89 and 90 to 1997 when the government of which I was a member took power, but I'm sure we'll all recall and those who were young will have heard of the impressive achievements of the Velvet Revolutions that toppled dictatorships across the Soviet bloc and then led on to the breakup of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's worth recalling that just like the early days of the Arab Spring, it was achieved by people power and without military action. It's also worth recalling in passing that Western intelligence agencies had absolutely no idea that it was going to happen. <laughs> and the lesson of that is not to think they know more than they, they claim to know because they're often not as informed as they suggest. We must also remember that in addition to these major historical developments, it was shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall that Nelson Mandela was released from prison and that signaled the coming of the end of apartheid and the effect that had had on Africa and all the conflicts in Africa that had damaged the, the development of the continent. So massive historical opportunity. Um, I think it's worth pausing at this moment to reflect on the way in which the Cold War had shaped all foreign and defence policy thinking across the world from the end of the Second World War until the 1990s. As well as the massive expenditure on nuclear weapons deployed against each other by both blocks, what was it? Enough to destroy the world six times over and still more were needed. Um, there were vast numbers of troops stationed in Germany and every conflict in Africa and Latin America saw the two sides lining up against each other through their proxies. From Cuba to Chile, Angola and Mozambique to Ethiopia, and in the Western support for the Taliban rebellion against the Soviet-supported regime in Afghanistan. And of course, there were major wars in Korea and Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s that took millions of lives. So that although the Cold War did not lead to an all-out confrontation, it did lead to many regional wars and considerable loss of life and a sort of psychology and analysis amongst defense and, cult and foreign policy experts, two sides, an enemy, organized, that kind of way of thinking about the world, goodies and baddies, organizing against the baddies, whichever side you were on. And I think the reality of the total domination of Cold War th thinking in the foreign policy and defense establishment for all of that time helps to explain the complete failure of Western policy towards the Balkans and in the relation to the genocide in Rwanda at the end of the Cold War. The old system had broken down. The foreign policy establishment was confused about what it was meant to be doing and failed completely and terribly in both of those situations. So it was in that atmosphere that the Labour government took power in the UK in 1997 and the new Department for International Development was established. <coughs> and the background to the decision to establish the department was a continuing division. This is important, you know, people, journalists now always comment as though sort of Tony Blair turns up and decides everything and it's all done because he thought of it overnight when he was watching the telly or something. And really, policy and institutional development is not like that, as I'm sure you all know. 
Um, the background to the establishment of the department was a continuing division between Labour and Conservative go government about whether the development ministry should, should stand alone or be allowed some autonomy but subject to all overall foreign office control. Since the establishment of the ministry by Harold Wilson in 1964, and of course that was based on the old colonial office, but then you're getting the independence of the countries that had a relationship in colonial times, so <coughs> Ministry for Development, but with the same budgets and relationships with countries that have very recently um, become independent. I mean, a new set of values, Barbara Castle was uh, the original minister and brought in economies, for example, that people called the Red Barons and thought it was intolerable that economists should advise on developing in development in newly independent countries, but that's the route. Colonial Office, Ministry of um, Overseas Development, it was, as it was called. Um, and then when the Conservatives came to power, it was rolled into the Foreign Office, and when Labour came back, it was rolled out to be an independent ministry. So that was the, um, the background. And I must just get my water, please forgive me. I'm sorry, it's got my mouth going dry. So in the run-up to the 1997 election, a Labour Party policy commission chaired by Robin Cook made a commitment to the establishment of a full development department headed by a cabinet minister. That had never been the case before. It had been a ministry, but it was a minister of state. And this would bring development considerations to the top of government, have the appropriate authority across Whitehall, um, a secretary of state in the cabinet. So that was an elevation of the commitment to development. Interestingly, or I think this is interesting, in the six months preceding the election, when traditionally opposition parties consult with senior civil servants in the ministries that they may take over, the Foreign Office pressed both Tony Blair and Robin Cook to cancel this policy commitment. And when I was appointed to shadow overseas development, Tony Blair asked me to look into the desirability or otherwise of establishing an independent department. And I do think, actually, in that period, Robin came to regret the recommendation that had been made. I looked into this question with some seriousness, examined the experience of the Scandinavian countries, which had a strong record on development and had experimented with different departmental structures, and consulted the permanent secretary at the ODA, who was absolutely clear that a separate department was essential if the incoming government wanted to make a strong new commitment to development. Happily, Tony Blair was preoccupied with other things and didn't look at my report <laughs> until he was appointing me as the new Secretary of State. My sense is that he would have liked to have rescinded the commitment, but decided at that time it was a battle too far. The important point here is that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office was furious about the establishment of the department. This isn't just gossip, I mean, it is interesting gossip. Furious about the establishment of the Department of De uh, International Development. And in the early months of the new government, briefed against the new department, tried to cause as much trouble as possible. This was perhaps an understandable reaction to losing control of the policy and the budget, although it was constitutionally outrageous. But in a sense, I think the Foreign and Commonwealth Office was right that a stronger development department would inev inevitably challenge foreign policy thinking, and therefore its authority. Thus, in 1997, we were in an era of defence cuts, cuts in the budget of MI6, and threats to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office budget. And these cuts were not the result of austerity, <coughs> but in a sense of past success. Cold War over, mission accomplished, don't need all these institutions anymore. So I can remember, for example, successive C's, you know, the head of MI6 called themselves C's, as in the, well, it's M in the Rum novels, isn't it? But C's, what they call themselves, calling to see me, which they must have hated. <laughs> but they came to my office to tr try to persuade me that we needed their services in Africa. I can remember saying, but are you saying that governments that we're working with in order to promote development that I should engage you to spy on them. I mean, this doesn't, but they were desperate. They, the budget was shrinking, their mission was gone. And that's just to give you a flavor of, of a sense of how things were inside the Whitehall machine. 
Um, so in DFID, the budget was only 2.2 billion pounds. It's now 8.5 billion. But we quickly established a strong new analytical and policy making capacity in areas such as trade and arms sales, and strengthen our capacity on areas such as international environment, the IMF and World Bank policy. We had a battle with the Treasury over whether Gordon Brown or I should be the UK Governor of the World Bank. As the policy lead on the World Bank was housed in the old ODA and now in the Department for International De Development, I won the battle, which was completely logical, but left the Treasury very upset. These anecdotes about the initial powers of the department begin to demonstrate, I hope, how the commitment to a separate department starts to push the development agenda up the Whitehall hierarchy and the holders of the old foreign policy thinking feel threatened, even in the initial stages, even by the new institutional arrangements. The important point that I want to convey is that the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence, and the intelligence agencies, indeed the Department of Trade and Industry, were feeling defensing, defensive, facing cuts, and lack clarity about their role in the world. While the Department for International Development was full of enthusiasm and clarity about its mission to seek to eliminate extreme poverty from the world and the possibility in this new historical era of making considerable progress. We very quickly published a well-received white paper reviewing all aspects of policy against the commitment to eliminate extreme poverty. And then we began the task of reviewing every aspect of the department's policy against this object, objective. This included all our country programs, our contribution to the World Bank and all the international development banks, our contribution to UN agencies and to UK NGOs. And it included the wider UK policy agenda on trade, arms sales, international environment agreements, World Bank and IMF policy, export credit guarantees, and so on. So the old ODA had been established to distribute the aid budget, collected together some brilliant people with capacity far beyond that task, but suddenly they were allowed to think beyond distribution of aid to all aspects of policy and take those arguments to the top of government. And that was upsetting to the old order. And very soon, for example, we became focused on the need to make greater efforts to end the conflicts in Africa that had proliferated after the end of the Cold War as the two sides drew back. Aid levels to Africa dropped massively. There was no point in propping up people like Mobutu anymore because he... Everyone knew he was a dictatorial kleptocrat, but he was a pro-Western dictatorial kleptocrat. But those, that wasn't needed anymore, so pullback and lots of conflict broke out, usually within rather than between countries, with most of those who were suffering being women and children who were displaced, that new kind of post-Cold War conflict that we experienced on such a large scale in those years. So... It became clear to the FID it was impossible to promote development where co conflict was per pervasive and therefore we had to look at what more could be done, what we could contribute, how we could push forward UK efforts, support UN efforts to bring these conflicts to an end. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office was furious. They were not much interested in co conflict in Africa but they wanted DFID to concentrate on distributing aid and not dare to think that it was entitled to take a view on conflict. The ending of the civil war in Sierra Leone has been talked about as one of Blair's wars in the John Kampner book, for example. It was no such thing. The UK military were deployed to evacuate the Europeans when there was a danger that the rebels would overthrow Freetown for a second time after the kidnapping of many of the UN peacekeepers. We in DFID had been involved in the humanitarian situation and into trying to support a very weak and actually not well-conceived UN peace process. And I and my department were therefore pressurising the Prime Minister to ensure that UK troops do not just take out the Europeans and withdraw, but remain to focus on strengthening the UN peacekeeping effort and training a new Sierra Leonean army. On this, Tony Blair's response was good. No one is all bad. Um, and once the Prime Minister showed enthusiasm, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office came in behind. And actually, the head of the um, 
the whole of the UK Armed Forces came to prominence in Sierra Leone, where he played a very good job, and, and uh, that's when he got promoted and so on. What's his name? David Richards. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, but my point here is that our focus on Sierra Leone, which was, I think, a policy in which we can take justifiable pride, flowed from the development engagement rather than foreign or defence policy priorities and wouldn't have been a priority in the past. Yes, the UK would have paid something towards a UN peacekeeping effort and said something at the Security Council, but it wouldn't have arisen as a priority to try and help stabilise the country. <coughs> Similarly, it was DFID concerns for the suffering of the people of Rwanda during and after the genocide that led to UK in involvement in supporting development in Rwanda and therefore focusing on the need to bring to an end conflict in the Great Lakes region. This became a major priority for the new conflict prevention strategies. This was the second comprehensive spending review, because, you know, at first, the Gordon Brown Committee to staying with the Tory spending targets, which Ken Clark said they would never have kept to themselves. Um, so there wasn't much money, which I think in the, case, in the early years, which I think in the case of DFID meant we went deeper in reorientating all the policy was actually if they'd given a dollar of extra money, we might have just spent our time spending the money rather than... Re so it had, it had some beneficial effects. But in the second comprehensive spending review, the Treasury came up with this idea that they wanted to leverage cooperation between departments. And um, departments were invited to bid for um, proposals that would leverage such cooperation. And so we, in DFID, put forward a conflict prevention, and it would be some money from the Treasury that the other departments would put money into that would pull them together and make them bring all their resources to the table. And we proposed that there should be a conflict prevention pool for Africa. And the Foreign Office was furious. And the Permanent Secretary he got his officials in and said, why didn't we think of that? And they made a big fuss, and they went to the Prime Minister, and, in, and they launched a conflict prevention pool for conflict in the rest of the world. And, um, and out of that came lots of perfectly good projects. But, you know, preventing conflict in the rest of the world with a, a small conflict prevention pool. But out of that came Foreign Office, DFID, MI6, the Department of Defence, round the table looking at conflict in Africa and, um, and what could be done. And on the back of our engagement with Rwanda and the desperate situation that there had been there, since 1994, it became a priority for UK foreign policy interventions in the UN and the Security Council to try and end the conflict in the Great Lakes. So it's another example of a policy priority that wouldn't have arisen in the past, that arose. And I'm not trying to say any of this like DFID is a brilliant organisation. It was, actually. And we worked very well together. But it's that the machinery drove the agenda. And that if you make the right structures, you open the space for the humanitarian agenda in a way that it isn't otherwise open. I mean, that's the point that I'm really trying to get across. Similarly, it was, um, sorry, it was um, DFID in 2001 too that tried to block the sale of an out-of-date military air traffic control system to Tanzania by British Aerospace that was both damaging to Tanzania's development and corruptly procured. Our efforts were strongly opposed by the Prime Minister, the Foreign Office, the Foreign Secretary, that was Jack Straw then, and the Ministry of Defence, and indeed it was Patricia Hewitt at the Department of Trade and Industry, and our objection overturned. That was 2001-2. As you're probably aware, in 2010, BAE, changed the name, pleaded guilty to corrupt behaviour in this case and paid fines in the US and the UK and was ordered to return £28 million to Tanzania. It wasn't always comfortable to be DFID because if you just follow with your mission, you're, you're facing resistance from all these other departments that are plugging away with the old values and the old ways of looking at the world. But it brings in the humanitarian agenda with a legitimacy um, institutionally. In November 2001, a new trade round was launched. DFID played a major role in the thinking that underpinned the launch and it was declared to be a development round to make trade rules fairer for developing countries. Remember that, that time? Every cow in Europe was subsidised with, I think it was the equivalent of $3 a day. More than half the world's population was living on less. 
uh, the distortions in international trade and agricultural trade remain, remain, remain to this day. But it was declared to be a development round, and again, DFID had a, a considerable influence on that. Sadly, this came to nothing, and it's probably a significant part of the explanation of this failure was that the commitment to development in subsequent years declined. When DFID first developed its trade capacity, the leading official in the Department of Trade and Industry was suffused with anger. Later, after he'd retired, the two departments undertook shared analysis, and officials in the Department of Trade and Industry became proud of their contribution to advocating a fairer international trading system. In the past, they'd only been invited and permitted to consider the UK's national narrow interest. And yet, in all of this, it's in the UK's interest to get a safer, more stable, balanced world, and yet the old order prevents the departments with influence from pursuing that kind of objective because they've always been ordered and structured to put forward a narrow, immediate UK interest. Um, and when, when it came to preparations for the new millennium, the world was looking for a suitable way to make, mark this great historical event, and it was DFID and the UK mission at the UN that proposed and worked for the adoption of the Millennium Development Goals, which arose out of the big UN conferences um, of the pre previous decade, John Tien on education, Beijing on women, you'll remember, Rio on environment, and so on and so forth. Um, and a commitment to the systematic reduction of poverty across the world was the way that was agreed by a UN special meeting that was attended by more prime ministers and presidents than had previously attended any UN meeting to be the way in which the international community would cooperate to mark the new millennium. A different time, a piece of space, some new institutional arrangements, the possibility of grabbing an agenda that all of you would understand that's finer but also more intelligent and safer if we could manage the world in, in this way. It's not possible here to outline all the issues on which the FID battled against other government departments and came out on top. The Department of Trade and Industry strongly opposed the abolition of the aid and trade provision, which used aid to subsidise British exports. I see, by the way, Mitt Romney has made a speech today saying if he wins the presidency in the US, he will use US aid in that way to subsidise and assist uh, United States exports. But we got rid of it. And the uh, abolition of tied aid. This is the idea, and many countries still use it, where you have to procure any aid is spent procuring things back in your own country. So say Germany and France and Britain cooperate to support um, development of health structures in Tanzania, and there's got to be new ambulances, then some will come from Germany, and some will come from Britain, and some will come from France, and then you've got to have spares, and it's a recipe for a disaster and inefficiency. And tied aid, which is still widespread across the world, was in place, and we managed to get rid of that over the um, strong objections of the uh, Department of Trade and Industry. And at the time, Margaret Beckett, who was an old mate of mine, was in the past, and indeed had worked as a special advisor to Judith Hart when she was the Minister <coughs> for Overseas Development, but she argued the case for the Department of Trade and Industry that wanted to keep these distorting old misuses of aid. And then in the case of the Jubilee 2000 campaign that wanted to abolish the debt of poor developing countries uh, to mark the new millennium, we were able to shape the outcome to require the World Bank to write off debt on condition that countries put in place a monitored poverty reduction strategy rather than the unconditional debt relief that the campaign advocated. And this, in turn, helped to reshape the World Bank's engagement with developing countries and to make measurable po poverty reduction the centerpiece of their programs and was a large move away from the old Washington consensus. This might seem self-praising, but what I really want to get across to you is just how that period felt and how the obvious things that you and I and we would all ad advocate had a clarity behind them that other departments didn't have because they were in the muddle of the Cold War hangover, and how easy it was in that time to push forward this whole agenda and really to advance the values 
of humanitarianism because others didn't know what they were doing and, and we had a clarity about what would be beneficial. So I hope I've been able to evoke for you the atmosphere within Whitehall in those times, the confidence of DFID and clarity of its aspirations and ability to win cross Whitehall battles in various areas. I should just for interest underline the fact that all, almost all of this was done completely outside the cabinet without the involvement of ministers in other departments except when there was resistance and then the department would play their minister to try to block us. But the mood of the times and the clarity and energy of the DFID's purpose meant that we frequently won the battles and if not, we'd come back and try again and very often win the second time round. Because we knew what we were doing, like you know what you're doing. And the others were in a muddle. They'd, they'd done it for 50 years and now they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. Then, of course, came the attack on the Twin Towers on September the 11th, 2001. And this was undoubtedly, as we'd all agree, a terrible crime, which led to a great loss of life and more dangerously, a sense of humiliation in the United States of America. It's worth remembering, given subsequent developments, how deep the, was the international sympathy and solidarity with the United States at that time. The Security Council of the United Nations passed a unanimous resolution deploring the crime and calling on all countries to cooperate to find and bring to justice the perpetrators. The UN General Assembly also passed an almost unprecedented unanimous resolution to the same effect, and Le Monde carried the headline in English, we are all Americans now. It's also worth, important to remember that the only weapons deployed in this attack were bolt cutters. And an ideology that distorted Islam to promote hate that grew out of the values of Saudi Arabia, the West's great ally, and was promoted by a man who came to fame fighting for the US interests against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Terrible as these attacks were, the response with the declaration of the war on terror, a massive increase in US military spending and then elsewhere, beyond even that of the Cold War years, was irrational. <coughs> If it's a man with an idea living in a cave somewhere, how can you possibly need more military equipment than you needed if you needed it in the days of the Cold War when massive nuclear armaments were trained um, on each other? But that's what happened. Uh, military spending was increased beyond Cold War spending levels. It seems to me as a response to the problem, this was completely irrational. And as you'll know, Vice President Cheney even ad advocated an attack on Iraq in the immediate aftermath of September the 11th, although Iraq had no place or role in it, but went to the immediate emergency meeting and said, that's it, we should attack Iraq. This is a matter of historical record, as I'm sure you know. From then on, the focus of foreign policy worldwide became the war on ter terror. And everywhere, what they meant by this was Islamist terrorism. And this, in turn, led to major distortions in foreign policy. And this is the important kind of argument I want to make. For example, they refused to recognize that Hamas had won fully democratic elections in the Palestinian occupied territories and thereafter led on to the cruelty of the siege of Gaza and the complete failure then to take any action or promote a just peace settlement between Israel and Palestine. The terrible suffering and anger that flows from that goes on and on. And that's flowing out of the, the reconfiguration of values and rhetoric that comes with the war on terror. Similarly, in Somalia, the conflict was seen through the lens of the war on terror and therefore the opportunity to achieve a settlement when the Islamic courts made their great advance, advance in 2006 was thrown away because, as I suggested, some of the elements might have been on the margin sympathetic to Al-Qaeda type ideas and said Ethiopia was encouraged to invade and all the rest of it. I would also argue that the failure to bring peace and order to Eastern Congo with the loss of five million lives and endless and continuing suffering was partly a result of it not mattering in war on terror terms. We had it, the biggest UN peacekeeping operation in the world, but very little priority from the, 
big powers in terms of political priority, providing logistics, making sure it was a success, a success and we've got the continuing suffering and mess and destabilization there now. I think if the um, Inter Hamoy, the Hutu fighters that were, and, and the, their political leadership that organized the genocide in Rwanda, I think if they'd been Muslim, it would have been different. And isn't that ridiculous? Isn't that ridiculous? Another example of lost opportunities was the civil war in Sh Sri Lanka. There was an effort to achieve a peace settlement beforehand and led by the Norwegians in which DFID played a part, but it wasn't a priority for the war on terror and the opportunity was lost. And the civil war took place and Sri Lanka is still scarred by the continuing injustice and persecution that has come upon that country since then or intensified since then. I believe that it's impossible to explain this irrational, wasteful re response to the attack on the Twin Towers, which has exacerbated rather than helped solve the problem that led to that attack, without going back to President Eisenhower's retirement speech to the American people. It was this former Second World War general and Republican president who warned the American people in his retirement speech to beware the military industrial complex, by which he meant the vested interests that want to make and sell wep weapons and therefore need enemies to fight. I'm not, of course, arguing that there did not need to be a response to the attack on the Twin Towers and the growth of Al-Qaeda, but I'm convinced that the strategy in Afghanistan after the Taliban had melted away was mistaken and the attack on Iraq was designed to fulfill the objectives outlined in the project for the new American century, i.e. to give the US permanent basis in the Persian Gulf, and the war on terror was simply used as camouflage for different objectives. But it created an atmosphere in which all the humanitarian values and international law was pushed back, and then these rather ugly conflict, military leadership, old-fashioned, goodies and baddies, um, let's use military means to solve all our problems, became dominant again, without even the constraints of the Cold War, where you had to be careful not to get a worldwide conflagration. Of course, in these times, development efforts continued and significant achievements have been made against the Millennium Development Goals. But the dominant, and, and I don't want to belittle that at all, and everyone must do what good they can do wherever they can do it, but the dominant discourse has shifted very considerably and irrationally away from humanitarian objects, objectives that are morally preferable, but also more likely to make the world safe and secure. <coughs> the major threats we now face of climate change and other environmental shortages, the massive growth in population that will take place over the next 25 years within the poorest countries, the growing speed of ur urbanization, which will make the poor increasingly restive and rebellious. These are challenges to the management of the period that we look forward to. All of these forces could be shaped to create a more just and secure future world order. But instead, massive spending on arms and foreign and defense policy capacity is being wasted in the creation of growing bloodshed and bitterness. I do not believe that the future is hopeless because the road we are on is wasteful and counterproductive. New opportunities will arise, just like that window that I've tried to describe. It will come again, um, and that will give the opportunity to shape better policy thinking. But the big message I want to convey today is that humanitarians must be ready with strong and persuasive analysis and capacity that will enable humanity to survive the next 50 years without major catastrophe and leave a decent settlement for future generations. I hope that this little story draws out powerful lessons about both what can be done and about the way in which political opportunities arise and then are lost. And setbacks are misused by forces that have a vested interest in conflict and military expenditure to drive back the values that most of us would advocate. 
I think if we study and learn from that, and we're ambitious in our humanitarian objectives, yes, we must do what we can now, but we must constantly be looking at how we can challenge the overall and not think, ah, oh, humanitarians belong on the margin. Other guys are in charge of defense and foreign policy, and then we do a bit of good around the side. We've got to be much more ambitious than that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Claire for a really engaging speech. We now have uh, about 15 minutes, half an hour for questions. Uh, my name's James Thompson, I'm the director of the HCRI and I'm gonna host these questions and I'll be looking around the audience for anyone who's got a pressing question. Um, and immediately I see uh, another director of HCRI on the front row, Roni Brownman. So Roni, question from you. We have, a, we have a microphone just here. As a member of the Mexican army of HCRI, I mean, <laughs> which has many <laughs> directors, uh, I'd like to express a s kind of embarrassment regarding uh, the notion of uh, development and this uh, normative categorization between developed countries and underdeveloped countries. And in the, in the current context, I was wondering what, well, some person like you would think about the China establishing a ministry for international uh, development and uh, well sending their own recipes for uh, real economic uh, uh, development. Do you want to reply? Yeah, I think that's a good I reply. understand what you're saying and I agree that the, the, the naming is out of date and patronizing. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's what it all came out of. And it does have good values within it and, and people that have clustered around that space who advocate transformative agendas. But I agree that that language should be dropped. I mean, in the case of China, they do have major concessional loan agreements, big Africa conferences every year, the same interest in Africa as Europe had wanting to get minerals and resources for their industrial development. So whatever they call it, they do it. Um, if I may, it was not exactly the underlying assumption of my, my question. I know they're very active in the so-called underdeveloped uh, world, by the way, they were describing themselves as, a, as the leader of the underdeveloped world at the time of the communism in, in, in China. My point was about, well, would they, uh, I, I mean, would they, if they would establish uh, Ministry of uh, International Development aimed at developing us, uh, the post-developed uh, uh, no, countries I th as but they I view I have, it. I think I have answered your point. They are absolutely focused on their own economic development, of course, with considerable success. And they now have a massive presence in Africa that they didn't used to have 15 years ago. And it's driven very considerably by their need for iron ore and mineral resources, which they desperately need for their industrial development. And they do deals government by government to build roads or whatever infrastructure might be required in, ref in return for deals on access to copper and iron ore and so on. So they're there in big numbers and more nakedly, they're saying, yes, we will promote your interests and we need your, um, now I don't know what they call that, that ministry, but they're there doing it. But I agree with you that the language is patronizing, but the, but that is not to say that the, um, the values that cluster around people who are committed to development haven't been far-seeing and wise and beneficial. Thank you. Tanya here, and then please. I'm the director of HDI. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks uh, very much, Claire, for your presentation. I have a comment and a question. The comment is, I grew up in West Berlin, on the island of West Berlin, which I use this term because it was paradise for around 80% of those who grew up. So I think I probably have a different take on the wall coming down, but that's just... <laughs> on, what? So, <laughs> on the wall coming down. Um, I have a question. I mean, I, I really liked... At the end of your talk, you said something about better policy thinking. There was this window of opportunity and we have to challenge the overall. But I would say, well, 
In the capitalist global world order we live in, there is a built-in of global injustice, global inequality, and everything one can do is always sort of window dressing. And okay, there might be, there might have been September 11th, which sort of allowed a sort of worse agenda to put itself on the line. But if that wouldn't have happened, some other dynamics would have happened. So I think the challenging overall would really, I think, if one takes it seriously, mean in a sense to challenge the global capitalist economic system. And if we look at DFID these days, I know this is past your time, one of the buzzwords of DFID in these days is resilience, which for me is a total misnomer because it seems to suggest we're not even trying to challenge the overall, we're just trying to make people cope better with the disasters that happen. But the disasters partly happen because we have a very unjust global economic order. So I'd like to have your comments on that. Well, the fact that you're in paradise in West Berlin, I presume doesn't mean you think the, the wall should still be there and you should be still <laughs> stuck in your little paradise. <laughs> Because uh, a lot of other people were very happy about those uh, about those developments. There is no doubt in in recent years inequality has grown in all countries. Um, this one in particular, uh, um, and the U.S. Greater inequality and less social mobility compared with say the 1970s. So, how do you challenge those? values of global capitalism. It's partly by political mobilization that after the Second World War won welfare states and uh, much less inequality, which, is, which we've gone backwards now. So I think an old idea that you just suddenly have a big revolution and global capitalism falls down and we make a, a perfect new order. I mean, it's not going to happen like that. It's the struggle and the contest. And the point is that reducing that inequality giving stability and security to people across the world, giving people the chance to be educated and be healthy and so on, is much cheaper than massive military spending, is morally massively preferable, and creates a safer, more secure world order. And that the, the values of humanitarians that point in that direction and to those kind of values, which is a challenge to global capitalism as it's currently operating in China as in uh, the United States of America, um, would create a different world order that was more beneficial. So, I mean, if you're saying there has to be a kind of big revolution and all the bad guys fall down and we all pull down the wall, I don't think it's going to come like that. But, of course, we have to challenge the, the growth of inequality and poverty in this country. And it's, it's this in the OECD, Britain and the US, 25% of people are on the lowest income and social mobility has gone away. I mean, that's a totally different society than the one I grew up in. And the kind of oppor life opportunities that someone like I, I had then have gone now. So that was a challenge to capitalism, and we need to do that kind of thing again. I've got three questions, one here, one here, and over here. So we'll start just here. My name is Annalisa. I'm a third year student doing international relations. Um, thank you for your talk, it was very insightful. Um, when you spoke about the Cold War hangover and the ways you had to handle some of the situations with the old views and the views which were more progressive, what do you think about the War on Terror hangover? How are we going to tackle the problem with the views and the um, maybe the paranoia coming out of that and the more progressive ways of tackling issues after that? How would you suggest that people manage the old views and the new views coming in? I think there's a real danger that things will get worse, that Muslims will be more and more vilified, both in countries that are predominantly Muslim and Muslim people in Western countries, the new Jews, the new black people, the people to be marginalized, attacked and vilified, and we're seeing that all over the place. And that as we get more catastrophes because of climate change and the rest, we could get more and more fascistic militarization. And I think that's a future that might be before us. And that's a sort of continuity from the war on terror. Or because we're going into a period of um, real economic difficulties in Europe and, and North America that are going to extend over a, a very long period, 
China's got to make a massive adjustment from the export model to um, bringing benefits to its own people that it's going to strain its settlement. India's got its own rows going on right now. Um, out of that period of contest, if there are, are, is good enough ideas and leadership, we might throw away the values of the war on terror and go more towards a safe, sustainable world order in which everyone can have a decent future, etc. And I think that's the job of now. And a good outcome is not inevitable. But neither is a bad outcome inevitable. And that's why we have to be ambitious. It's not good enough just to run nice refugee camps. Important as it is if people are refugees. Gentleman. And for your generation, that's the task. There's a gentleman in a striped shirt, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Fred. I'm a visiting academic at this university. Uh, Miss Short, you remembered very fondly in Rwanda for having been very instrumental in helping that country lift itself up from the effects of the genocide. Today, President Kagame is one of the African leaders at the forefront of seeking to win his country off aid uh, because he thinks that there is something fundamentally wrong with African countries subsisting on aid. And there is also the argument that um, aid shields African governments from domestic accountability. So they become accountable to donors rather than their own people. In your tenure as minister in charge of foreign aid in this country, did you ever stop and think there was something fundamentally wrong with aid? Thank you. Well, yes, but Rwanda, after the genocide, when I first went to Rwanda in 97, there were still emergency feeding programs and the institutions of the state were not remade and people were in a very difficult condition. And the, um, the Kagame government, he was the vice president at that time, were very um, scarred by the attitude of the international community, trusted no one, and the projections were that there'd be very little economic growth. There would be a growth in population because decimated populations always replace themselves and there'd probably be more trouble and contest. Um, Kagame's been a great leader in throwing away the, the pass books that differentiated on the population, focusing on education and economic development. But 40% of public expenditure is aid and it therefore, Rwanda has been able to achieve more and more rapidly than it would possibly have achieved without any external assistance. And given the historical exploitation and misuse of the country, um, there's nothing improper about it. When we made our first uh, development program with Rwanda, they were very determined not to be pushed around by external forces. And we made a 10-year agreement with written down commitments about what we would work on together and with an external ag agency monitoring the performance of both sides so that both were subject to criticism whether or not that they, they should um, keep their word. But if, of course, and Kagami now is very exasperated, um, I know him quite well with the uh, current accusations that have been made that have come around in, in, in various cycles of attack and has asked the people of Rwanda to make contributions towards replacing aid. But Rwanda would grow much more slowly and its people would prosper more slowly if the 40% contribution to public expenditure was taken away. So the fashion, and what's her name, the, the attractive woman's book, uh, of saying get rid of aid means slower affording of children being able to go to school, um, of improved healthcare systems and so on. So I think aid well deployed should be looking to work itself out of existence, give countries a chance to invest in their people and make advances and then um, it should disappear. But if it's removed, a lot of countries and a lot of people will take a lot longer to, um, to develop and improve the lives of all the people. It is true that there's a problem with aid in that it distorts accountability of governments, but of course there's the same problem with mining and oil and gas. 
that when rich resources, in the, and that's one of the reasons why you get a resource curse, rich resources flow to government, they don't have to tax their people in order to provide their services, accountability weakens, and often you get problems of corruption and misgovernment. So yes, there are problems, but to wish it away would be to wish Rwanda to have had less success than it's had up to now. And irritated as Kagame gets with the international community, he's not advocating getting rid of that 40% contribution right now. He's saying he wants to get rid of it as soon as possible when Rwanda can pay for all its own development. Gentleman in the corner. My name is uh, Paul Koji from the university down the road. Um, <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I've enjoyed your talk, um, but I do have um, two problems with it, one of which is uh, a conceptual one. Um, looking at the title, it's almost like the end of history, as it were, because you talk about the surge, and then you talk about the demise, and then you dated it, 200, uh, 2003. Now, I just wonder how that conceptualization of a problem of uh, humanitarian intervention actually <laughs> squares with the MDGs which still has two years to run. So how can you claim there is a demise when in fact there is a global intervention which is trying to tackle the problems of poverty in two years' time? I don't think there's any end of history. What I'm, what I'm doing, and I say it's a personal account in my title, and that it was just a period of time when, as I tried to describe, the foreign policy establishment suddenly didn't know what they were trying to do. And the values that come out of the humanitarian movement became more ascendant and, and advances were made, like the MDGs being put in place. But of course, they um, actually, they were put in place in 2000, but started from a date preceding that. And there's a committee now at work to say what will happen after 2015. And I was talking to someone on the, uh, there's a report on the education goal about to come out. And there's been a weakening of progress since 2007. So I'm trying to give you an account from inside government of a little period of time after the end of the Cold War and before the declaration of the War on Terror when there was more political space for and advance in humanitarian values. And then it was more difficult. It didn't die, but it was more closed. I'm trying to share that with you because I think it's interesting and I think we can learn lessons from it, but there's no suggestion that it's the end of history or anything like. I don't think that's good rhetoric, but not very, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Gentleman there. Thanks, Sam Hickey, Institute for Development Policy and Management. Um, two, two quick ones. Um, the first one, I just, I wonder about the we in all of this. Who, who is the we? And it could be, you know, it's difficult in lots of ways, but in particular in the way that Fred pointed out, um, in relation to the we being the West, I presume in your talk, but African leaders often being the key players in whether or not development gets delivered. And I wonder if you can reflect on perhaps using Uganda and your closeness to Museveni as well there. Uh, once debt-led, the debt-led focus on poverty disappeared and natural resources and China arrived, the language shifted very quickly away from poverty and humanitarianism towards structural transformation and other ideas. And, and that we between the West and certain African leaders seemed to disappear. So I wonder in the current global order, what does, what does we mean uh, in that sense? And secondly, very quickly, um, why do you think Cameron stuck to uh, the 0 0.7 target, and now we have an accountant rather than an activist in charge of DFID. How long do you think that will last? The we, in what I had to say, was we working in the Department for International Development in the UK. So we were a collective making some efforts. I wasn't including President Museveni or President Kagame in that we. I mean, I had relationships with them, and I'd, in the case of Museveni, 
it was already going wrong. There'd be, you know, measurable achievements in um, children in school and reduction of poverty, but there were real problems on defence procurement and uh, the way in which the money that went into that was taken out of the budget and so on. And things have gone more wrong since then. So I don't know, you asked me to comment on Museveni, and that's my comment. Um, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that because people working in the Department for International Development in that time are working to try and improve the way in which the UK works on these issues, that that means we're more important players than leaders in African countries. I mean, there's no suggestion of that in any way. But it's a, an international effort that ought to include all parties. Why did Cameron stick to the 0.7? I think there's no question he was trying to decontaminate the Tory brand. Um, he made a commitment to, to achieve that, you know, the nasty party and all the evidence of the polling that was in place and that uh, Theresa May talked about years ago. And he made a commitment to protect the National Health Service. Don't know quite what happened to that. And to stick to the 0.7 target as an emblematic, we're not nasty anymore. Um, aid spending levels had been cut under Thatcher. And of course, 0.7 would be 12 billion. British um, public sector spending this year is 666 billion. So you can sound generous with very little money. Um, and he's under attack from his party for so doing, and he's repeated the commitment just currently. But I think it's because he wants to have some soft edges to the image of his government. He thinks this is cheap at the price. That's what I think. <laughs> There's one question here, and this will be our last question. Thank you very much for uh, the wonderful lecture, uh, Ms. Claire Short. Um, my name is Samburu Washiko, and I'm my first year PhD student here, focusing on uh, post-apartheid um, South Africa. Um, I was very pleased to hear you refer to both South Africa but also Rwanda uh, in your lecture uh, because as part of the upcoming um, new African um, generation, uh, a lot of the kind of global arrangements uh, that we have at the moment in the space of development, uh, international aid, uh, is of significant pertinence to us because we are very, very conscious as young Africans of the fact that um, we will be shouldering uh, the responsibility if things were to go wrong. And history is, has been a great teacher uh, that has lo a lot has gone wrong uh, on the continent, uh, and especially with regards to how the continent interacts with our so-called development partners. Um, I'm particularly interested in your views around um, South Africa and where South Africa is headed um, post-apartheid. Uh, there's a school of thought that submits that one of the greatest faults uh, of the ANC government was that there was a great deal more focus on um, reconciliation as opposed to transformation um, with how um, the apartheid project was going to be handled and dismantled. Um, so I'd really appreciate your views on that. But I'm also very, very uh, interested in following up uh, on the question that was earlier asked on uh, Rwanda, uh, because that's, I think if this lecture was happening uh, in an African setting, um, a, a significant part of the audience would be leaning more towards uh, a Kagame style uh, of leadership as opposed to a whole lot of other um, leaders on the continent today who are fairly barren, I think, as far as articulating a really sober um, appealing vision is concerned. One of the reasons I think why President Kagame uh, is attracting a lot of interest and traction is that he is amongst the very few African leaders who have been able to paint a really, really clear, articulate vision for where the country is going. Um, when you contrast that with what's going on in a lot of Asian countries, you see similarities, and yet sometimes Kagame um, is given a lot of flack, especially in uh, Western circles for doing exactly that, for having the courage to articulate a view that doesn't sit uh, very well 
with our so-called Western partners. I'd really appreciate your views. Thank you. Post-apartheid South Africa, as you know better than um, me, the people, the poorest people in South Africa have had a better life, but inequality has widened instead of narrowed. And some privileged black people have joined in the privileges of white South Africa rather than the whole society be transformed and, and the inequalities of apartheid eliminated. So, and clearly we're seeing some of the anger and disappointment. I think initially people were pleased at the freedom, pleased at some of the improvements in water and you know, some immediate benefits, and now there's a, there's a surging anger. And I don't know, need to say this delicately, but some of the ANC leadership seem to have become very interested, or the previous ANC leadership, in enriching themselves rather than in bringing benefits to the people. So where, where will it go? I mean, I think history can go wrong everywhere. You know, I, I tried to say earlier, I think we're facing some very big challenges globally and things could get very nasty or we could make an advance. I think it almost has to be one or the other. It's not going to be sort of status quo because there are big challenges coming at us. And in South Africa, I mean, there's a lot of people who are disappointed and disgruntled, um, but maybe out of that and out of the new generation, there will, be, there will come a new leadership that will do better. Um, and that's obviously what needs to be worked for. And there must be a reduction of inequality and an improvement in the life opportunities of all the people. Um, and I don't know which will happen, and I'm sure there'll be um, some turbulence on the way. I think people don't like to criticise Nelson Mandela because he's such an enormous figure of our time. But his leadership did focus on reconciliation. And was that right or wrong? If, if, if there had been war, it could have been terrible. That's the trouble with history. We pocket the achievements and then, you know, complain about the things we haven't achieved. So I, I agree with your description of where it is and the problems that are faced. And there's going to be a lot of trouble if there isn't more progress in lifting up the life, life opportunities of, uh, of poorer people. And the growth of inequality is really an intolerable failure. Into this comes the whole question of natural resources and the natural resource curse. Um, there's been this super cycle in uh, prices of mining and oil. Um, and yeah, 50 countries in Africa have some oil and obviously mining prices have gone up enormously um, because of developments in China and India, but China in particular. And in so many countries, that seems to lead to a growth of corruption, inequality, instability. There is a resource curse. And the task of working together to, I mean, it's one of the things I'm trying to work on, but it's an enormously big task, make more transparent the kind of co contracts that are made, that the payments are properly made by the companies, because, of course, some of the biggest profits that are being made in the world are mining oil and gas companies, so they're obviously extracting a lot, lot and then they're not paying proper taxes, and they're off in, into uh, tax havens and so on. And that's an issue for South Africa and more broadly across Africa as well as other countries, and there's a big resource there that, if better used, could really invest in development that would lift up the lives of hundreds of millions of people and replace aid. And in the, ca the question of President Kagame, I mean, he's, we worked together extremely closely for um, a period of time and stayed in touch afterwards. I'm um, a supporter of President Kagame. I think the achievements that have been made in Rwanda are enormously important. Um, there has been carping criticism from the very beginning. There was a francophone critique that wanted to drag down that leadership. Um, and we saw it, I saw it when I was in government and uh, trying to influence UN reports and so on. Obviously, I don't have any inside information about the current allegations, but there, it's like it all coming back again. And of course, if the east of Congo is destabilized, it affects Rwanda very badly. And if only eastern Congo were stable, then it would help Rwanda's development. So they've got a, both an interest because the former genocidaires are there in the eastern Congo in reduced numbers. Numbers have gone home um, in recent years. And because instability damages them. But as you know, his aspiration is to be a Singapore of East Africa. 
Um, it's a very beautiful country, fantastically fertile, but with very high population in very small territory with this very difficult history and it's landlocked so everything's expensive because it all has to be brought in by ports and there's a lot of interest in building trains and so on to reduce those costs. So it's not simple, but the achievements um, up to date are phenomenal. And I think um, Prime Minister Mele Zanawi of Ethiopia similarly was accused by Western forces of being very authoritarian, but similarly there was very considerable improvements in economic development in Ethiopia, a very, very much bigger country with a much bigger population. Um, and it's a different kind of model. Um, my sympathies, I mean, I don't know the details of these allegations that are made in this current report, um, but I think Kagame is a beacon in Africa. Many Africans see what he's achieving and his clarity as very attractive and want leaders that be behave like that. I mean, the other big thing for the continent is if only the post-colonial boundaries could be dissolved and the continent used the strength of its billion people to be like a China to, to, to attract inward investment and take over lots of the investment that would come as Chinese wages go up, there'd be a real opportunity there. So I think, and I, the other thing I feel about Africa, very there's a massive growth in educated population. Um, the number of uh, graduates per year has grown and grown and grown. There's a youth population, there's more educated population, with much better knowledge and communications because of modern communications, that I think is going to demand very considerable change and bring about considerable change. But I think we'll see turbulence on the way, and it, nothing succeeds like success. If there's progress and advance, the continent will move forward. But it was Donald Kabaruka, I'll make this my last remark, you know, the president of the Africa Development Bank used to be the finance minister in Rwanda, who said, Arab Spring, educated, angry young people, corruption, lack of dignity, lack of life opportunity, this doesn't stop at North Africa. Uh, and if there aren't some changes, that sort of turbulence and uprising will come across the country and is to be welcomed, provided it leads to progress rather than chaos. So it's a very important time. I think there's lots of reasons to be hopeful, but it's not inevitable that everything will go well. It's going to take a lot of good people working for those objectives. Claire, thank you very much. On a positive note of uh, progress, not chaos, I'd like to uh, thank Claire ever so much for her speech. Uh, thank everyone in the audience uh, for attending. Uh, if you want any more information about all the different launch events of the new School of Arts, Languages and Cultures, you'll find it on the university website. Similarly, uh, uh, different lectures and different public events from HCRI are advertised on the website, so please have a look at those. But thank you once again to Claire for a really stimulating talk, and thank you for the questions and for your presence here as well. Thank you.